If you had a time bomb ticking away under your home, what would you do? If you didn't know it was there, you would probably just go on with your life until one day, suddenly. Sorry? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. Assuming you survived, you would scramble to put out the fire and rebuild your home at immense cost and great pain. Now, what if, before it came to that, you had noticed the constant ticking sound at your house and you took time to investigate? And you found the time bomb. Would you just go on with your life and pretend it wasn't there, hoping it wouldn't go off? You might be right. Maybe it would never go off. That ticking sound in Canada is the debt bomb waiting to go off. Here's the simple math. Total household, corporate and government debt is more than 3.5 times the size of Canada's gross domestic product. That is higher than in the United States during the subprime housing bubble that would later burst into the 2008 financial crisis. Traders here working the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out waiting to see how low the Dow will go. They're focused on the Dow, not so focused on... Higher than in Greece during that country's debt crisis. ...fearing for their jobs threatened to commit suicide by jumping from the window ledge of their office in Athens. Both and higher than in 45 of the 48 biggest debt crises around the world in the last century. If our debts are so high, why has there been no crisis so far? The answer is that interest on our debt has been at record lows for almost a decade and a half. Sure, rates have risen in the last 18 months, but those increases have only begun to apply to a share of our total debt stock. Much debt, such as fixed rate mortgages and long-term government bonds, have not come up for renewal. As time goes by, that debt rolls over into higher rates and the servicing cost will gradually rise. Canada has a total of $10.2 trillion in personal, business, and government debts. That includes credit cards, car loans, mortgages, small business loans, government debt, etc. $10.2 trillion works out to $255,000 per person, or nearly $620,000 per household. The average interest rate we are currently paying on all forms of debt is 4.72%. However, the average over the last 61 years is 7.6%. So what happens if at some point down the road, the interest rates paid on our debt return to their normal, historical averages. Well, it would raise Canada's interest costs by nearly $294 billion a year, which is almost as much as Canada spends on health care, more than 10% of our GDP, and equal to $17,806 per household every year in recurring costs. This documentary does not predict if or when a Canadian debt crisis will occur. It simply sets out the facts. Those facts are that if our debt is still 3.5 times the size of our entire economy when interest rates return to long-term historical averages, we would need to devote more than a quarter of our GDP just to paying the interest on our debt. That would all but guarantee a debt crisis. This is detonation. Now, is this something only investment bankers and economists should care about? No. They'll find a way to protect themselves. As always, this is something we all need to care about. Although the danger of a debt crisis can be explained in graphs and charts, the real danger is not about numbers. It's about life and death. The human toll of debt crises is staggering. They produce massive unemployment, which leads to increased depression, suicide, alcohol, and opioid addiction, overdoses, and other miseries. Two Harvard economists who have studied 800 years of debt crises, Kenneth Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt, found they typically bring 35% declines in home prices, leaving people with mortgages that are worth more than their homes. On average, GDP falls 9% roughly twice the GDP drop during the COVID recession of 2020. Unemployment rises seven percentage points, which lasts about four years. That means not just a loss of livelihoods, but a loss of lives. A University of Calgary study found that a 1% increase in the unemployment rate increases the suicide rate by 2.1%. Researchers estimate that the financial crises in Europe and North America in 2008 and 2010, and in Asia in 1997, resulted in 10,000 extra suicides each. Then there are the drug deaths. 
Researchers found that when unemployment in a country rises one percentage point, the opioid death rate jumps 3.6 percentage points, and opioid overdose emergency room visits rise 7%. When the Greek debt crisis collapsed wages, pensions, and social programs, desperate people flooded into psychiatric hospitals. The Council of Europe's Commissioner of Human Rights wrote that, quote, most patients admitted under this regime are unemployed persons, bankrupt businessmen, or parents who have no means of taking care of or feeding their children. Most are reported to be over 40 years old and have never shown previous signs of mental illness. That is the power of debt. Then there are the painful government policies that follow debt crises. Some of the harshest austerity measures in the response to the Greek debt crisis were enacted by the self-described Coalition of the Radical Left, an alliance of communists, eco-socialists, and anti-capitalists. We are going to destroy the basis upon which they have built for decade after decade a system and power from everybody else in society. Why would parties with an ideology that believes in boundless government programs slash public spending so dramatically? Well, for the same reason that the federal liberal government in Canada cut the jobs of 45,000 public servants and removed $7 billion from health care, education, and social services in the 1990s, and for the same reason that the Saskatchewan NDP, a party that credits itself with inventing Canada's Medicare program, shut down 52 hospitals in the 1990s. Like, I, I just think we lost a lot when we lost our hospital. That reason? They were broke. Which proves that debt crises do not care about ideology. Numbers are not partisan. Merciless mathematics trump political philosophy in a debt crisis. When the money is gone, there's nothing left for wages, pensions, hospitals, schools, food, and other essentials. Numbers rule the universe. What would such a scheme cost? Well, I wouldn't make a promise if I didn't know what it would cost. I wouldn't buy a set of long underwear if I didn't know what it would cost. Austerity is almost never a choice. It happens when crisis leaves leaders with no money and no other choice. Those Harvard economists Dr. Reinhardt and Rogoff also found that financial meltdowns cause government debt to, quote, explode. An explosion within an explosion. A crisis on top of a crisis. That is why it is always most humane to protect a country's finance in advance to avoid a crisis and to avoid austerity. Then there is the possibility of a stagflation debt crisis, which means there is both high inflation and high unemployment at the same time. That is what happened after Pierre Elliott Trudeau combined a policy of running massive deficits and printing money to pay for it with a major governmental assault on Canadian industry, particularly Western Canadian industry. These policies are now being replicated by the younger Trudeau. The stagflation crisis of Trudeau Sr. should remind us that inflation and unemployment can be high at the very same time. Look at the years from 1980 to 1983. During that Trudeau debt crisis, unemployment and inflation each hit 12%. At the same time, interest rates rose to 19%. This was the year the recession was supposed to end. Twelve months ago, the government's main concerns were interest rates and inflation. But nearly two million Canadians are out of work. The nation is in its worst economic crisis in 50 years, and no one knows when it will end. Well, I mean, you kind of cut back on the grocery bill quite a bit, and cut down on the heat, and clothing. Getting married in July, I don't even know if I got a job. Stagflation is miserable. So miserable that economists use a misery index to measure it. This index is calculated by adding the inflation rate to the unemployment rate. In 1982, the misery index in Canada hit a high of 22, with 11% inflation and 11% unemployment. That was up by half from six years earlier, almost double the long-term average, and the highest ever recorded in Canada. People not only lost their money, they lost their lives. When the misery index gets high enough, people take drastic steps to end their misery that the uh, mass media are tending to try to make citizens experts on everything. You know, only about one-tenth of you should be listening to that news. Uh, the suicide rate reached a record high in 1983, Mr. Trudeau's last full year in office, at 14.8 per 100,000. 
That was an 8% increase from 1980. Seven of the eight worst years for the suicide rate in Canada happened when Pierre Trudeau was Prime Minister. And the suicide rate rose 50% from the year he took office until the last year he held power. And even today, the pain and anxiety of doubling home prices, rising homelessness, and generationally high inflation has otherwise healthy people considering ending their lives. The CEO of the Mississauga Food Bank has said some have reached out asking for help with medical assistance in dying, not because they are sick, but because misery and poverty is too much to go on living. I, when I say that this is an emergency in the community, people who are living at the bottom income percentile in our community are talking to us now about taking their own lives because it's too hard to be poor any longer. Starting March 2024, Justin Trudeau's Bill C-7 will provide medical assistance in dying for people whose only condition is mental illness. This government will treat depression with a lethal injection or ingestion in just a few months. The misery is the same today as under the first Trudeau, and so are the policies that caused it. Printing money to fund massive deficits combined with attacks on small businesses and resource development. Before long, printed money drives up the demand that businesses cannot meet, too many dollars chase too few goods, and inflation spikes. As a consequence, interest rates rise on the debt levels that people cannot afford to pay. What will happen this time? We don't know for sure. You'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. Uh, you'll understand. But we do know that one of the following scenarios will occur. One, interest rates come down fast enough to forestall the crisis. But extreme debt levels continue to weigh down our economy, suppress wages, and lower living standards for years to come. The debt bomb keeps ticking while Canada stagnates. Two, interest rates don't come down fast enough in the short term or rise in the medium term, which gradually makes servicing our record debt loads impossible, causing cascading defaults and bankruptcies and a national debt crisis. Or three, a common sense plan to grow Canada's income and shrink its debts protects us against detonation and secures our economy, our homes, our families, and our safety net. So which will it be? Well, we will decide. And how will we know if there's trouble on the horizon? To see forward, we must look back. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes. In his 1931 Maclean's Magazine essay, Churchill explained how to see the future. There are two processes we adopt consciously or unconsciously when we try to prophesy. We can seek a period in the past whose conditions resemble as closely as possible those of our day and presume that the sequel to that period will, save for some minor alterations, be similar. Secondly, we can survey the general course of development in our immediate past and endeavor to prolong it into the near future. To forestall Canada's debt destiny, we must do both. It was these steps that allowed me to foretell the inflation interest rate and housing crises we have today years ago when all the experts said they would never happen. As a consensus among economists, our biggest concern here is that net-net, this will be a disinflationary occurrence. But we have historical evidence that rates can be high in a weak economy in the early 80s. We had an extremely weak economy and we had extremely high interest rates at the same time to combat out of control inflation. Why would we risk that repeat? And it will be these steps that will allow us to foretell when a crisis is near. Fortunately, doctors Rogoff and Reinhardt have made these steps easier by compressing 800 years of debt history into four main indicators of a forthcoming crisis. There will be many deep thinkers today who will say, these indicators might have worked to predict things in the past, but the modern economy has broken free from all the rules of history. This time is different. Ironically, that last sentence, this time is different, is the title of Rogoff and Reinhardt's book on the very subject, because it is what people say every time we lead up to a debt crisis. They write, the essence of this time is different syndrome is simple. It is rooted in the firmly held belief that financial crises are things that happen to other people in other countries at other times. We are smarter. We have learned from past mistakes. The old rules of valuation no longer apply. 
Unfortunately, a highly leveraged economy can unwittingly be sitting with its back at the edge of the financial cliff for many years before chance and circumstance provoke a crisis of confidence that pushes it off. This time is never different. The four leading indicators of financial crisis apply everywhere, including here. Here they are. One, a sustained debt buildup, especially household debt. Two, asset price inflation, especially real estate. Three, falling output. And four, large current account deficits. In the upcoming episodes of Debt Nation, we will go through these indicators one by one, and we will do so with stoic realism, knowing the risks ahead should not scare us into denial, but spur us into action. As Seneca says, this is a reason for ensuring that nothing ever takes us by surprise. We should project our thoughts ahead at every turn. That way, we can protect our future and march forward into it with growing optimism and hope.